What was the hardest at the very end to part with? Cheese. I was addicted to cheese like most people are. You are listening to Veggie Doctor Radio, and this is episode number 201. Welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. I am your host, Dr. Yami, board certified pediatrician, certified lifestyle medicine physician, certified health and wellness coach, author, speaker, mother, wife, and human being. I passionately believe in the power of diet, habits, and mindset in sparking and sustaining well-being and joy in our lives. This podcast combines expert interviews and thoughtful monologues to explore plant-based nutrition, lifestyle medicine, parenting, mindset, and other exciting and fun topics. I hope that these episodes inspire you, uplift you, and equip you with the knowledge and tools to live your best life. Are you ready to get started? Let's do it. Welcome back, veggie lovers, to another episode of Veggie Doctor Radio. Today, I have Dr. Judy, who is one of my friends, and she has a lot of amazing things to teach us today. But before I introduce her, I want to remind you that the information on this podcast is for informational and educational purposes only. It is not meant to replace careful evaluation and treatment. So if you have concerns about you or your child's eating, nutrition, or growth, please consult a doctor. So today I have my friend, Dr. Judy Brangman. She is a board certified internal medicine physician, and she also has her lifestyle medicine board certification. She obtained her doctor of medicine from Wake Forest School of Medicine and completed her residency at East Carolina University by Dent Hospital. In addition to her board certification in lifestyle medicine, she also has her certificate in plant-based nutrition from the T. Colin Campbell Center for Nutrition Studies, and she's been plant-based for over seven years, which you're going to hear her story soon. Her passion is for helping people of color transition to a healthy plant-based diet so that they can live an abundant, more purpose-filled life. She does this via online programs, courses, and her social media platform at The Plant Based MD. She believes that in order to fully live the life you were intended to live on this earth, you need to be in optimum health, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. She is originally from Bermuda, and I love her accent. You're going to love it too. And currently resides in Raleigh, North Carolina. In this episode, we talk about her plant-based story We talk about what she thinks is the most powerful benefit of a whole food plant-based diet, what her experience has been working with women of color, what she thinks is the biggest myth that she repeatedly encounters on a plant-based diet, her experience as a frontline physician during the COVID-19 pandemic, what her favorite lifestyle medicine pillar is besides nutrition, And we talk a a little bit about her faith and how she thinks that that is part of the counseling that she gives patients and how she feels that it could resonate with some patients, what she wishes more people knew, and her lifestyle habits, including her morning routine, which sounds amazing, and what delicious food she cooks. It's a great episode. She is so adorable, and we have a really good time on this episode, so I know that you are going to love it. Dr. Judy, my friend, welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. Hi, Dr. Yami. I'm so excited to be on the podcast today. Well, I'm so glad you're saying that because literally I had to twist your arm to get on this show, lady. And I'm glad that one of your (laughs) loyal followers who adores you was like, please get Dr. Judy on your podcast. And I was like, I've been trying to get her on my podcast for a while, okay? So so thank you. I know we're going to have a fun, fun time. I yes. want to know your background as far as your plant-based story. Tell us, how did you discover plant-based nutrition and what was your transition like? So my story kind of goes way back, actually. So I've been plant-based myself, um, hopefully food plant-based for about seven years or more but actually I grew up kind of in a vegetarian or predominantly plant-based household as a um, seven-day Adventist which part of the uh, faith is embracing a healthy eating pattern so we never ate a lot of um, meat and we didn't eat red meat Um, but it wasn't until when I was in residency as internal medicine residency and I was trying to figure out like 
how can we prevent patients from becoming sick? How can we prevent them from getting these chronic diseases that we are treating? And no one seemed to have an answer for me. They were just like, well, it's genetic or it's something that develops as you age. And for some reason in my spirit, I just didn't feel that that was the final answer. I knew that there had to be more. And so that led me to research. And then I just kind of stumbled upon plant-based nutrition, which ended up being a blessing. And it opened a door for me to really find my niche in medicine, to find a place where I felt like I belonged. And it also gave me sort of additional meaning and purpose in life, whereby I feel like there's something that I can offer the world, really, that is not being offered in traditional healthcare and medicine. And so since I've been on that journey, it's just been remarkable. You know, initially, I think when I got the inspiration that I should go plant-based, it was about, uh, I would say, 12 years ago. And I was very resistant at first because, like most people, consuming dairy was something that I never thought that I could give up. You know, baking without eggs and milk, like how are you supposed to do that? Um, But, you know, when I felt, you know, my spirit that that's what God wanted me to do, um, I eventually began on that path slowly over a matter of years, <laughs> gradually transitioning to a plant-based diet. And, um, it's really funny because back then I would have never dreamed that making that decision would have led me to where I am today, whereby I have, you know, a profession, a business, you know, a social media platform and people that are reaching out to me to reach them in this avenue. So it's just been amazing and I love it. Wow, what a beautiful story. So tell me, what was the last holdout? What what was the hardest at the very end to part with? Cheese. I was addicted to cheese, like most people. I My mom would tell you when I was in high school in Bermuda, we have uh, New Zealand cheese. I don't know if they sell that here, but it's like fresh New Zealand cheese and it's like the best thing ever. So I, so I thought. So I'd buy the cheese and I would eat it plain, eat it with crackers, grilled cheese sandwich. A lot of the dishes in Bermuda involve cheese too, like Papua casserole, macaroni and cheese. And I just love cheese. And I was like, at that time, I don't think they had vegan cheeses like that. Or at least in Bermuda, I don't remember seeing them. I think there was cashew cheese, but I don't remember seeing as much cheese substitutes like I see you know, now, um, 12 years ago, but yeah, that was my hardest, but eventually really what it came down to was a mindset shift where I said, okay, um, I I had tried going plant-based and cutting out cheese for periods of time. And I noticed that my acne, uh, cleared up. So that was kind of my motivation because even if I ate a small something that had cheese in it. Let's say a little piece of one spoon of macaroni and cheese. I'm just going to eat a little, little, little bit. The next day I would have, you know, a breakout of like acne and pimples and everything. So for me, it became like a beauty thing. Like, okay, I like clear skin, so I cannot eat dairy. And that was that. Nice. Well, whatever works, right? (laughs) Yes. Well, I imagine that that experience has given you a lot of empathy for your patients and your clients that say, but Dr. Judy, I could never give up cheese. Yeah, a hundred percent. Like I totally get it. You know, most of our cultural foods involve animal products to some degree, even the way we view the plate is very meat centric. You know, people tend to think of a meal as, okay, what's the protein? Everyone's so concerned about protein. And so animal protein is the only source of protein. And you fix a plate without animal products on it and people look at you like wow where's the meat (laughs) you know where's the meat but people don't ever say well where's the vegetables and that's what it took for me and this is what I kind of teach my you know my clients and my patients is it's a mindset shift rather than viewing a plate as inadequate if it doesn't have meat on it you should view a plate as inadequate if it doesn't have at least half of it vegetables and it needs to have some green leafy vegetables if it doesn't in my opinion, it's an inadequate meal. <laughs> yes. Oh, I love that. I love that way of thinking about it is how can you add these foods into your diet and whenever they're not there, 
miss them, you know, because you're right. I I feel like before I went plant-based, that's how I used to think about meals first. Okay. What meat are we going to have? And then I'll scramble to find some sides. But really the focus Mm -hmm. was on the meat. It wasn't on the fiber and the antioxidants and the things that help us feel good and live long. So it's a complete mindset shift for a lot of people. Right, exactly. And what I started doing with my patients is just as a casual pool, um, as internists, you know, the primary conditions we see are heart disease, stroke, diabetes, obesity. So I started asking people, how many fruits and vegetables do you eat in a day? And to this day, I have not had one person say four servings or more, even three. Like most people, it's one or two. And so that's that's where the problem lies. And so that's my focus is encouraging people to incorporate more of that into their plate instead of saying, okay, take this away, take this away. Let's get the vegetables in first and then crowd out the other things over time. Mm, I love that. And you're right. I I mean, basically you're just sampling the general population, right? Which shows that less than 10% of Americans actually eat the recommended amount of fruits and vegetables. So 90% of us are not eating enough. And I like to think about the plant points from Dr. Will Bolsowich, his book, Fiber Fueled, And sometimes I have salads, like the recommendation is to try to get 30 plant points a week. So basically 30 different plants for gut health, right? I have meals where I get over 20 plant points in the meal, you know? So that's a big extreme difference from, from, you know, but you know, like to me, it's a game. It's like, all right, what else can I put in my salad? It's so fun. Mm -hmm. I impress my kids all the time. So what do you think is the- yeah. What what do you think is the most powerful potential benefit of a whole food plant-based diet? The antioxidants, the vitamins that you're going to be getting, the fiber, which as we know, helps with a healthy gut microbiome. Um, you know, fiber helps with satiety, which can help with weight loss. So I think it's a comprehensive eating plan as opposed to some of the other ones that, you know, focus solely on weight loss, but then it causes your cardiac markers to worsen or your cholesterol to worsen. And it's an eating pattern whereby you don't necessarily have to count calories or carbohydrates. It's kind of a lot more simpler than people make it out to be, I think. And also it's beneficial for the environment, animal welfare. Um, just all around wholeness. Yeah, so many benefits, you're right. And I think you're also right in that a lot of people in the United States, they're used to complicated eating plans, right? Like they're told you can't trust your body, so you need to weigh and measure everything. You need to count your calories, eliminate all of this stuff. You can never eat any carbs again for the rest of your life. And when they hear about eating more whole plant foods, it almost seems too simple, right? (laughs) So I think that some people, Mm -hmm. because they've been told this myth that our eating has to be complicated, sometimes it can seem that incorporating more whole plant foods into your diet isn't going to be enough. But tell me, what have you seen as far as patients and clients that you've worked with Can you give us some tidbits of the transformations you've seen in in health benefits from eating more whole plant foods or transitioning to an exclusively plant-based diet? Yeah, so I'll give you an example of a patient that I had um, because I think a lot of the stories we hear about people that have been fully plant-based, but you can get remarkable transformations by going, uh, by making a 50% improvement from where you are. So I had a patient, she was maybe 65 years old. She had been diabetic for five plus years, maybe even 10. She was on oral medication, maybe one or two. Um, So she'd been diabetic for a while, right? No one had ever told her that it's possible that she could lower the medications that she was on or improve her blood glucose. And she, uh, being in North Carolina, And also, I believe she had a farm. They ate a lot of bacon, uh, pork, fried food. She was eating a lot of, um, and asked her how many, you know, vegetables and fruits she was eating. She was like, I don't really like vegetables. They don't really taste good. So she was eating like maybe one, one or two servings a day. And so I just started out with her and just told her about the benefits of a plant-based diet. And her eyes lit up when I told her about how 
that she could possibly take less diabetes medications if she changed her diet and ate more vegetables. So I just gave her one simple tip to increase the amount of vegetables that you're eating. I'll go from one to three if you can handle. And then, you know, the goal is like five or six. And so over time with me working with her, you know, when I came, when she came back for her visit, you know, two months later or three months later, she was like so excited. She was like, Dr. Judy, I've been eating more vegetables. You know, I've been trying to eat less processed foods. Um, and then gradually her hemoglobin A1C came down. It was, it was 10 or nine initially. And then, um, with her making the changes, it came down to like seven. Um, and we were able to decrease the doses of her medications. And she was still eating animal products. She was still eating uh, some chicken, some dairy. So that was rewarding for me and reassuring. Um, you know, in primary care, they give you the, um, uh, one of your quality metrics is how many of your patients' diabetes is uncontrolled or how much of your patients' blood pressures are uncontrolled. And I felt fully confident that whatever patient worked with me, I would be able to get them down to an acceptable level. So my list of patients whose diabetes is, is uncontrolled is not going to be, you know, long. And I was fully confident in that. So that was just one story that I would never forget because that was an early experience for me with this because sometimes I think people think that you have to do all or none. You know, you have to completely abandon everything. And although that may be the narrative that some people want to uh, share, it's just not 100% you know, accurate and not everybody wants to go fully plant-based and not everyone needs to go fully plant-based. And I think that's where I differ than some other people in the vegan community who feel that everyone needs to be a hundred percent. Yeah, no. And it, you just are able to make it more accessible. Cause just like you said, she lived on a farm, her lifestyle probably wasn't going to go a hundred percent different right away. And maybe as she tunes into how she feels, maybe over time she'll eat less and less and less animal products, but it was only because you were able to empower her so that she could choose the pace that she wanted to go. And she saw results and that must, that must've felt amazing. How, what her, was her reaction when she saw that her numbers were coming down like that? She was so excited and surprised because she was like, no one ever told me that I could improve my uh, blood sugar. You know, I thought I was going to have to be on these medications forever. Um, so that was definitely um, encouraging to see. She was an older lady. Like I say, she'd been seeing other providers before me. And for whatever reason, she switched to me. So it was like a new new patient for me that I was seeing. And I was looking through her history and I was like, yeah, you've had diabetes all this time. But um we can probably get you down off the medications a little bit. I don't tell people you can reverse diabetes. I don't use that term. Um, but, you know, depending on how long you've had it, um, there's a possibility that most patients can at least reduce the number of medications that they're taking. Yeah, I love that story. Well, tell me about your experience in working with women of color and what their needs are when it comes to transitioning to a plant-based diet, whether it's predominantly or exclusively plant-based diet. And where do you think they struggle the most to make the transition? That's a good question. So, you know, um, this is a statistic that the black community is like the fastest growing um, population that's moving in the vegan direction. Um, so that's definitely exciting. And I think making it more accessible to people of color, whereby we don't view it as a white thing, quote unquote, because I have heard people say that. So I think probably it would be a mindset shift for some people of color who feel that eating plant-based is not a part of their culture. And I've had patients say that to me. Um, but, you know, when you look at our ancestors and uh, countries overseas, for example, the continent of Africa, Caribbean nations, they're predominantly plant-based or plant-forward. They do consume meat and dairy, but it's very much vegetables, fruits, you know, starches and different things like that. So I think that's probably the biggest challenge for people of color is accepting that this is for us too. This is not something that's just for them. And then also that if you look at the, the data and the outcomes of chronic diseases with regards to outcomes for minorities, if you look up any condition, you will see that 
people of color tend to have the highest rates of heart disease, the worst outcomes from heart disease, um, and poorer outcomes from diabetes as well. Um, the reasons for that are multifactorial, right? There's access issues, there's healthcare disparities, there's racism and different things like that. So if there's any group that needs an extra edge up with regards to their health, I would say it will be people of color. So we owe it to ourselves to be healthier, to take our health in our own hands. Because what I found with people in general, but especially by special color, is that there's a distrust of the healthcare system. We don't like going to the doctor. We don't like taking medications. Only 4% of physicians in the U.S. are of color, and only 2% are um, black females. So a very small percentage of physicians are people of color. So that leads to um, just cultural differences, you know, when you interact with the patient. So I think diet is key. Hey, veggie lover, if you are looking for free resources to guide you on your plant-based and healthy living journey, go to dryami.com forward slash free for tons of free downloadable PDFs. Hundreds of people have taken advantage of my tips to help them reduce meat and dairy consumption, navigate eating out, and build satisfying plant-based meals. Download one or download them all. And don't forget to share with friends and family. DrYami.com forward slash free. And now back to the episode. Wow, that's such great information. And yeah, recently I was reviewing some of this data because I got invited to do a talk on veganism in the black community. And there was a lot of things I didn't know, but one of the things that struck me was that when they've done studies of black or African-American people transitioning to a plant-based diet, their benefits and their changes ended up usually being even more than compared to non people that were not of color. And so what that means to me, just kind of like what you were saying, is that people of color may benefit even more from this way of eating. You know, so it may be one of those things that really gives that advantage, gives that edge. And it's just a simple, simple change in the diet. So it's so interesting to learn that. Tell me about your take on soul food and Southern food, you know, especially where you live, there's probably a lot of access to that. And I'm assuming a lot of people are like, oh, but I want to eat this and I want to eat that. And that's what I grew up with. What do you tell your patients and clients when they tell you that? You can pretty much veganize anything. <laughs> and soul food is no exception, you know. So the foods that, you know, traditionally you think of as Southern foods, you can alter the recipes and make them plant-based. You know, there are things that you can use instead of ham hocks, smoked ham hocks, they sell smoked flavoring in a bottle if you want to use that. Or you can use something like smoked paprika, or you can put barbecue sauce and whatever it is to get that kind of smoked flavor. You can even put vegetables on the grill to kind of get that flavor if you choose. You know, if you're trying to substitute something like macaroni and cheese, you can use uh, nutritional yeast and make a cheese sauce with uh, cashews and blend it up with lemon juice and put some garlic in it. So it does take more experimentation and trying different things in the kitchen. But I believe that you can replicate a lot of those same flavors. And then I believe also that food is not just about taste. It should be tasteful and it should be healthful. I don't want to continuously be putting things in my body that is not going to help me to live healthy live long and live well, because that's not what I want for myself. So I think that for someone to make that shift, again, I keep saying mindset, you have to view yourself in a certain way and say, okay, food is about sustenance. It's not just my taste buds, how they feel in that moment. Yeah, for sure. And I always remind people that your taste buds adapt and your brain, your neurons, they adapt. So 
at the beginning when you transition and you're eating more vegetables, you're not used to it. It may not taste as good to you. You know, fruit may not taste as good to you as a cupcake or a donut, but after you've been eating this way for a week or two, three or four weeks, all of a sudden you're like, wow, did these oranges get sweeter? Did this apple get sweeter? You know, like, and this doesn't taste quite as bitter to me anymore, the vegetables. And then you learn little tricks, just like you were saying, making different sauces. I think sauces are magical. Honestly, you should always have some sort of sauce to put on your food because it just elevates the whole experience, you know? It does. So you it learn does. these different ways and your food, I mean, like, we do not oh. suffer at all in this household. <laughs> I mean, we eat so good. In fact, we're usually fighting over food because even when I double and triple recipes, we eat like mm -hmm. the whole thing. I call it the Lancaster phenomenon. So basically that means that no matter how much food I cook, we're going to eat it all. Okay. <laughs> so, because it's really good. It's really good. <laughs> yeah, I agree. A hundred percent with the taste buds with, with regards to, you know, salt, sugar, and fat, right? Those are the th three things that, you know, your taste buds seem to like, mm -hmm. if you want to say that. But I found, you know, when I cut out sugar, because I've done that recently, cut out all added sugar. And when I eat something that's sweet, like an apple pie or a piece of cake, it doesn't taste good to me. It tastes kind of toxic, like too sweet. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas I get pleasure from eating a strawberry an apple, an orange. That's what I eat now when I want something sweet. So the same thing can happen with salt. You know, if you're used to using a lot of salt, decreasing it, your taste buds will change. And then when you eat something that has salt in it, it will taste salty to you. Like right now, if I eat certain things, it tastes salty to me because I don't use a lot of salt. And you know, when I have friends over and I'm cooking, they're like, oh, can you put a little bit more salt in it? Sometimes they say that. And to me, it tastes salty already. That's that neuroadaptation. It's amazing and it's magical. Well, what do you think is the biggest myth that you repeatedly encounter about plant-based nutrition? Yeah, so there's a couple of myths, but I would say probably the biggest one is that plant-based eating is expensive. And I don't know where that came from because one day I actually went to the store to price out a variety of different meats, a variety of different cheeses, fruits, vegetables, and nuts. And by far in between, the animal products were far more expensive. You look at the price of chicken per pound, um, lamb, beef, ground beef, cheeses, compared to the fruit and the animal products is more expensive. Now, again, this goes to people kind of making things a little bit more complicated. If you're buying the processed vegan food items, um, you know, the soy burgers, the Beyond Meat, the Impossible Burgers, the cheeses, that's going to be more expensive. But a whole food plant-based diet where you're buying beans, fruits, vegetables, whole grains like quinoa, uh, brown rice, it's not expensive. Now you can make it more expensive if you decide to do organic, but you don't have to do organic. I don't do organic with everything and I don't think it's necessary either. Um, if you look at the data, there's not strong data to say that you need to be organic with everything you eat. That's, that's what I um, have read. So that's the biggest myth I would say. And I think it's a myth that prevents people from even trying sometimes because they say, oh, it's too expensive. I can't afford it, you know. But it was funny because when I was doing a talk a couple of years ago and I and I touched on this and, I, you know, I showed them the prices and had the pictures of everything. And then somebody was like, you know what? We know it's not really that much more expensive, but it's just we just want to keep eating meat or something she said. Like she was just <laughs> like, you know what? This is what it is. It's just easier to keep eating meat. So we tell ourselves these things so that it will be a barrier for us in our minds. And I just yes. thought that was interesting that she just, that that person in the audience said that. That's so cute. Yeah. Basically, she was like, actually, it's just an excuse, a very convenient yes. excuse, right? <laughs> right, <laughs> but right. This, but what about that? <laughs> but what about this? Yeah, for sure. Well, let's switch gears for a little bit. And I want to talk about what your experience has been being a frontline physician during the COVID-19 pandemic. I know you've been working really hard for the past two years treating patients with COVID. Do you feel like your background and your training in lifestyle medicine has helped you better treat your patients with COVID or counsel them during this time? 
being a physician on the front, the front line during COVID probably is equal to an experience that no healthcare provider could have ever imagined or prepared for adequately. It's one of those once in a lifetime experiences that you don't want to go through again. Um, and so learning more about what risk factors are in place that increase the risk for severe COVID has been interesting. You know, reading the data about which groups of people are at higher risk for severe COVID, those with chronic diseases, hypertension, diabetes, being obese and overweight, um, having lung disease. And what it has done for me is changed my outlook in a bit so that it makes me feel that it's a bit more urgent for me to get this message about lifestyle medicine out there because it's one thing when you see something in an article in a research article but when you actually see that transcribed into practice whereby I can almost predict whether someone is going to develop severe COVID or not I mean it's just it's just very interesting to see um you know the, the younger people that we've seen getting sick with COVID are unanimously mostly always either with a chronic condition or overweight. Um, and so hopefully, you know, we are able to learn some lessons from this pandemic so that if or when the next one comes, we would have less people that are at risk already from, you know, the standard American diet, which as we know is inflammatory, you know, the high sugary foods, which is inflammatory. And that's one of the biggest causes of mortality with COVID um, is the immune response where your immune system basically goes crazy trying to attack the virus and it ends up attacking your lungs and your alveoli and everything like that. And that's what leads to respiratory failure. Um, so yes, it's definitely been an interesting um, life-changing experience, I would say, for sure. Yeah. I mean, it, it has been incredible to just be able to see like, wow, our habits and behaviors do make a difference. And you're right. My husband is an internal medicine hospitalist as well. So he's been on the front lines this whole time. And he says the same thing. I mean, when his patients come in, he can pretty much predict which ones are going to continue to tank and which ones are probably going to end up in the ICU and the ones that aren't going to do as well and the ones that probably will do a little bit better. But wow, what what an experience to go through all this, to see firsthand right in front of your eyes diet and lifestyle really do matter. And it's things that just like you said, if we can help people and we can empower people that they're able to make small changes little by little over time so that they can have the well-being that they desire, then hopefully if this ever happens again, it won't be the same way, you know? Yes. Yes. I, I hope so. Besides nutrition, which I know is probably one of your favorites, is my favorite as well. What other pillar of lifestyle medicine would you say that you like to discuss and teach your patients about after nutrition? I would say probably the one that is overlooked, which is sleep. Everyone talks about exercise, right? There's no question that people believe and understand that exercise is beneficial, but people don't realize the importance of sleep. And when I was doing primary care, I was astounded at the number of patients that would come in with issues that were related to sleep. And because of my lifestyle medicine training, I'm certified in lifestyle medicine. You know, I study the topic. I have tools that I can give patients of how you can sleep better based on, you know, what their problem with their sleep is, like what lifestyle changes they can make to improve their sleep. So I would say sleep for sure. And particularly for people that are trying to lose weight, if you're not getting adequate sleep, you're going to be hungrier during the day um, because sleep affects, lack of sleep affects your hunger hormones, leptin and ghrelin. So I would say second to nutrition, I would say is sleep. And also because I like to sleep. I make sure I get my seven to eight hours of sleep every night. I do not stay up late unless I'm working on a project but for the most time. For the most part, I did not stay up late and I make sure I got my seven to eight hours of sleep. I have it in my phone. You know, I track my sleep. It's like a big deal for me. <laughs> I love it. Well, that's why we're friends because I 100% agree with you. And I actually call sleep a keystone habit. And the reason I do that is because when we get adequate sleep, when we get adequate restorative sleep and we're consistent about that, 
we're able to maintain our other lifestyle habits. So making good food choices comes easier. Doing your exercise, your joyful movement comes easier. Your stress level will be lower, less mood and anxiety problems and depression because you're sleeping. So I feel like it's that habit that holds everything together. I mean, I imagine you've had nights, you know, in residency, we had to lose sleep. We had no option. We right. were forced into sleep deprivation. We ate very unhealthily. Yes. We were <laughs> crying all the time. I mean, I don't know about you, but literally everything made me cry all the time anxious, depressed. Of course, we could not exercise because we were so exhausted. Right. So that sleep, when we're not getting that sleep consistently, it just throws everything off. And then you're frustrated because you're like, why can't I do these things? You can't do those things because you're not getting enough sleep and your body's literally trying to survive, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, so important. So important. Yeah. I think somewhere I'm trying to reclaim all that lost sleep from residency and medical school. But you know, they say, I read that if you miss sleep you can't technically regain it it's just kind of like lost yeah it's over for us judy lost mm -hmm. forever <laughs> <It's over. laughs> that's you why we have to be like back. we have to be like perfect about our habits now you know yes well let me ask you something because you mentioned at the beginning that your faith was part of your motivation and part of your transition into eating in a whole food plant-based way. How do you incorporate your faith into working with patients and clients? Do you feel like that's something that people like that you integrate? Or do you feel like it doesn't really come in into your conversations very much? It comes into my conversations naturally. It's not something that's necessarily spoken, but people can tell that I care deeply about them on a personal level, you know, and also I listen to my patients because, you know, I believe, you know, as a Christian, I'm a Christian, I should treat other people the way I'd want to be treated, the way I want my family to be treated. So I think that they can sense the kindness, I would say, not necessarily that I'm saying anything in particularly about my beliefs. Um, and then when the door opens, you know, it does get discussed because sometimes patients do bring it up. North Carolina has a high Christian population. Um, so, yes, it definitely comes up and people do seem to, you know, appreciate it. Yeah, it just seems to me like for some people, if that's one of their values and that's something that they connect with, that it could be something that resonates with them as far as like the connection between their faith and their well-being. Oh, yes. I see what you're saying. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yes, definitely. The connection between, sorry, faith and um, well-being and the way you treat your body, so to speak, as being a, a, an act of worship or, you know, mm -hmm. I'm doing this because my body is the temple of God and I want to treat it in the best way because, you know, the creator created me. So, yes, there is definitely that connection. Um, and I do help with my church. I mean, involved with, you know, planning health events with my church and in my community in North Carolina, Raleigh, North Carolina, where I reside. So yeah, it's my mission in life, really. I love it. That's beautiful. What do you wish more people knew? What do I wish more people knew? I wish more people knew that plants is everything. It just is. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's I that's the quote of the like... year right there. <laughs> What do I need to do to be healthier, Dr. Judy? Eat more plants. Well, what about protein, Dr. Judy? You don't really need to worry about protein like that because did you know that plants have protein? Oh my goodness, I did not know. What else can plants do for me? Yeah, so that's basically what people need to know, that plants are everything. Oh, I love Literally. it. That's, that's the best. <laughs> All right. Well, speaking of plants, I I'm just curious, what is your diet like? What are your go-to meals? And personally, besides nutrition, which I know is super important, and you already talked about sleep, but maybe you can give us a little, a few tips on how you maintain your sleep. What are the lifestyle habits that you implement on a regular basis? Okay. So the lifestyle habits, and this has been remarkable for me getting my day started, setting my mood right. It's getting up and having meditation or worship. You know, I play this app and it's like 
a meditation app, but it's a Christian one. So it's music. She's talking to you or reading scripture or something like that. And I just lay on my, um, my mat on my bed, on my back, like I'm in like a yoga class and do that for like 10, 15 minutes in the morning before I do anything, before I check my phone, before I brush my teeth, before I do anything else. Because if I start doing something else, it's not going to get done. And I find just doing that sets the tone. It helps them relax me, brings my heart rate down. And then, you know, I read scripture for a little bit, but mostly that meditation, quiet time where I'm not thinking, I'm not doing anything. I'm just laying there. That's how I start my day. And then I usually get something for um, breakfast. And then I work in the afternoon. So I usually go for a walk in the morning. Um, and that's kind of like how I get my physical activity in. I'm not a hardcore gym person. I kind of like to just do simple things like running, walking, like outside on trails or riding my bike. That's kind of what I like to do, um, for fitness. I would say those are the main things. I think having a routine is key because once you get into a routine, it's, it develops a habit, right? So it's like becomes a part of your day. And when it's not there, you really miss it. So I think setting habits is key. You know, doing something consistently, you can get a calendar and mark it off. If you're having trouble sticking to a particular habit, that way you can kind of see, you know, how often you're doing it and kind of keep track of it. And then give yourself a reward if you want for doing it for a period of time, whatever period of time that you set. That's kind of how I advise people if they are having trouble making a lifestyle change is try and make it a habit. Yeah. Have a calendar. And give yourself a little reward, not not candy reward, but you know, a good reward. <laughs> Just not candy. <laughs> so I love it. Give yourself a nice reward, like buy something, you know, something <laughs> that you want or need. Yeah. How about it? How about reward yourself with a kale salad? No, I'm just joking. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> salad. I used to buy electronics because that's what I'm into these days and household stuff. So nice, nice. Um, yeah, your morning routine sounds very relaxing and, oh, I, I love my morning routine. It's very similar, but I'm a little bit, my has to be cut short because I have to get the kids to school and get to work myself. But I dream of one day having a long, luxurious morning routine, you know, like two hours, like a two hour morning routine where you can meditate and journal and do your exercise and go for a walk and just like ah, savor, savor those moments in the morning where it's nice and still and quiet. And now for a very important message. Hey mama, if you are feeling frustrated about mealtime battles, worried that your child isn't eating enough or eating enough vegetables, afraid that your child is going to get some awful deficiency or disease because of the lack of diversity in their diet, I wrote a book that might be for you. A Parent's Guide to Intuitive Eating, How to Raise Kids Who Love to Eat Healthy is available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook through all major online booksellers. Did you know that most children are born with the innate ability to eat the appropriate amount of food to satisfy their hunger and support appropriate growth? Despite this, parents are still anxious and confused about how much and what to feed their children. In addition, many children are labeled as picky eaters or develop behaviors such as hiding and sneaking food. There's also a growing epidemic of dieting behaviors and eating disorders beginning at alarmingly young ages. In my book, you'll learn the five pillars of healthy eating, how to apply intuitive eating through all the stages of development, lifestyle habits that support healthy eating and body image, troubleshooting and problem solving for picky eaters, overeating and dieting behaviors, how to create and foster a healthy body image in your children, how exploring your own body image and relationship with food will help raise an intuitive eater, and what foods to offer your child at different stages of development. A Parent's Guide to Intuitive Eating, How to Raise Kids Who Love to Eat Healthy, available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook through all major online booksellers. Are you ready for a fresh approach to feeding your child? For more information, visit dryami.com forward slash book. And now back to the episode. Tell me about your food. What what kind of 
what are your typical go-to meals? What do you like to eat? So my go-to meal that I make quite often is actually jerk tofu. I know it sounds strange. You're like, jerk tofu, how do you make that? Um, so I do it, yeah, so I like jerk tofu. I use the Jamaican jerk seasoning, um, marinate it, and I basically cook tofu just like how I would cook you know, how I used to cook chicken. In my mind, you, you marinate it, you season it, same things. And if you think about meat, we season meat with plants anyway, because meat by itself doesn't have that appealing taste. And we have to cook it because we can't eat it raw because maybe we're not meant to eat meat. But anyway, that's another story. But um, I digress. <laughs> but yeah, so tofu. I like tofu a lot. I make scrambled tofu for breakfast. Um... What else do I make? Smoothies. I like making smoothies a lot. I make a lot. I make uh, for breakfast my own scones. We call them scones in Bermuda. I don't know if that's British, but it's kind of like a biscuit, but not as much bacon soda in it. It's a little bit heavier. Uh, I make corn muffins. Um, I make my own pancakes, vegan pancakes. So I make my own different breakfast items, oatmeal. I know breakfast is more challenging for a lot of people, so I'm just listing some breakfast ideas. Uh, oatmeal, grape nuts. Um, and funny thing is enough, as I say, you know, we, I'm Seventh-day Adventist. We grew up kind of eating pretty much healthy. My parents are health nuts. So we didn't eat sweet sweet cereals. We didn't eat junk food, really. You know, my mom was one of those people that for birthdays, oh my gosh, she used to make a cornbread and it probably was low sugar or maybe she put vegetables in it. And I'm like... <laughs> this is what we're eating for birthdays, but that kind of has, you know, stuck in my mind of, you know, like how to eat. So that's how I eat. I eat very clean. That's what people say. It, but to me, it's like a way of life. Someone was at my house today when I was eating, and they were like, you always eat so healthy. Like, you've got a lot of vegetables, you know, it's not fried. And I was like, this is just the way I've been eating. You know, I feel better eating this way. And so, you know, it's, it's, reaping the benefits, so to speak. Yeah. And just like you said, it reinforces itself, right? Because you feel good. You feel good. And so you keep eating yeah. that way and you've already developed your habits and routines and you feel confident that you can make your food taste good and delicious. And that's going to make you feel full. So it's not a big deal for you. You know, you've already, that's part of your life. So for some people, they feel like, you know, they need to be there right away, but it might take months and years for them to get to that place where it just feels like so easy. Like it's not any work. Like I feel like me coming home, even if I don't have something planned, I can easily whip something up that's going to be satisfying and delicious for everybody. Eating at restaurants is not a big deal. I don't get stressed about it, but don't feel like you have to be at that level right away. It's going to take you a little experience, a little trial and error, and then someday you'll get there and it won't be, it won't feel difficult and that you have to take so much time to think through it, you know? Yeah, I think that's key and very important because you know, both of us have been on this journey for years and we didn't get here overnight, you know, and it took trying recipes so many times. I've probably made, you know, any given dish that I would say I'm experienced in, let's say tofu, I've probably made it hundreds of times. <laughs> you know, sometimes I've thrown a dish out or it didn't taste good and I started all over, but it's just part of the process. Yes. Well, your breakfast sound amazing. So I'm um, currently just booking my ticket to come stay with you so that you can <laughs> feed me. Okay. So don't be surprised when I knock on your door. I eat You're a lot. Anytime. So buy a lot of food. Okay. <laughs> All right, Dr. Welcome anytime. Judy, thank you. Thank you. Tell us how listeners can connect with you and what products and services you currently offer. So listeners can reach me on social media, Instagram and Facebook at the Plant Based MD. And my website is the same, theplantbasedmd.com. Um, if you want to reach me by email, my email is info at theplantbasedmd.com. Um, currently, I'm working on launching an online course, um, a couple of webinars coming up as well. Um, so that's pretty exciting and definitely looking forward to helping inspire, you know, teach more women how to transition to a healthy plant-based diet. That's that's my goal and the overarching, you know, purpose of uh, my business and everything that I do is to make going plant-based seem doable 
and easy. I love it. And do you want to share the name of your course? Not yet, but I would say go to my website and subscribe to my email list. I have a freebie on my page. It is um, my wellness guide, my top tips to living your best life. And my email list is where I share everything that I'm doing coming up. So they will be the first to know about the course. So definitely check out my website and join my email list to Perfect. stay so up the, to date. The plantbasedmd.com, go get your wellness guide and get on that list so you're the first to know about the course. Dr. Judy, this has been fantastic. My last question or my last request of you is to leave us with your number one tip for busy moms. What is one thing that they can do starting today to work toward the well-being that they desire? So I would say for nutrition, get the whole family involved in cooking and meal prepping. I would say I think busy women probably have trouble with the food part. You know, people often say, oh, I wish I had somebody to cook for me. But you can make it fun and make an experience that the kids will enjoy, get them involved with it, and that they will have a vested interest in and probably be more likely to enjoy the food too. So I would say get the whole family involved and meal prep. You don't have to cook every day or even every other day. You can batch cook beans, rice, quinoa, your grains, and then when you need to you know, prepare that particular meal, you can take it out the freezer. So meal prep and using the freezer and getting the family involved. Definitely. I love it. Such great tips. Dr. Judy, this has been wonderful. Thank you again for finally coming on the show. <laughs> you are welcome anytime. It's an open invitation. I appreciate you. I'm grateful for you. I am so glad that you're out there inspiring other women so that they know that they can reach the well-being that they desire through these simple lifestyle habits and nutrition. So thank you so much. And I hope that you have a very plantastic day. Thank you, Dr. Yami. I'm so grateful for you and all that you're doing and for our friendship. I love your podcast. Aw, well, I hope you just fell in love with Dr. Judy. If you don't already follow her, please go follow her. She's at the Plant Based MD. And she could use your support. She's launching this new course. Go support her. Go learn from her. As you can see, she's a wealth of knowledge and experience. She really cares. And she's got some great things to teach. So it was that was a great conversation. I just loved hearing her transformation story, how she went plant-based, but also her authenticity and her honesty and transparency when it came to talking about the cheese. Because I don't hear that a lot from medical providers. In fact, maybe it's because for me, cheese was never a thing. Like I was never a cheese person. So hearing that it took her a long time to finally let go of that cheese, I hope that that helps you feel that she can identify with you and that she understands what that's like. So that was an excellent episode. I hope you got a lot out of it. Thank you so much for hanging in there and listening. And as always, I hope that you have a very plantastic day. Hey, veggie lover, I hope that you loved today's episode. Will you take a second and do me a huge favor? Please subscribe to my podcast so that you never miss an episode. You're the reason I'm here and I want to share it all with you. Thank you for listening and have a plantastic day.